Hi, and welcome to Stefan Levera Podcast, a show about Bitcoin. So before we get started, just a quick announcement from me. I have accepted a role at Swan Bitcoin. So I am now Managing Director of Swan International. So as many of you know, Swan has been the lead sponsor of my show for some time now, and I have been an advisor for them also. So I thought this was a good opportunity and a natural fit for me to actually join the team. So I'll be helping out in terms of uh, assisting uh, in various capacities, whether that's helping high net worth individuals or companies and others and businesses onboard into Bitcoin and purchase Bitcoin with Swan. So that's some of what I'll be getting involved with as the managing director for Swan International. And to be clear, SLP carries on as normal. There will be no changes there. Stefan Levera Podcast is a Swan-sponsored show, but it is not a Swan show, if you will. And definitely it will remain a big focus in terms of my time and my effort. So just clarifying that there will be no changes from your perspective as a listener of SLP. So my guest today for episode 299 is Adam O of Upstream Data. He joins me to talk about the opportunity for oil and gas with Bitcoin, optionality, the necessity of fossil fuels, ESG, Bitcoin Mining Council, and Bitcoin lobbying. So this show is brought to you by Swan Bitcoin, the best way to accumulate Bitcoin with automatic recurring buys and instant buys. Swan Bitcoin takes a specific focus on education and content and community. So the more you know, the more you buy. And Swan is Bitcoin only. So there's no confusion with altcoins and there's not even a sell button on the platform. It's a great place to send your pre-coiner and new coiner friends. Also, for those of you who are high net worth or business or corporate or other entities, there's Swan Private, where you can buy Bitcoin and have direct access to a Bitcoin expert. And I'm actually part of that team also. So I might be the one helping you in terms of purchasing your Bitcoin or helping present to your business on why Bitcoin. So to sign up, go to swanbitcoin.com slash levera. Lend at Hodler Hodl is a peer-to-peer Bitcoin-backed lending platform where you can lend out stable coins or borrow against your Bitcoin as collateral. And this is available globally and anonymously. So you can earn extra income on those stable coins. And on the other hand, if you need some fiat liquidity, you can put up Bitcoin. And you still hold one key in a two of three multi-signature and HODL HODL does not hold your funds. There's no rehypothecation here. Lend at HODL HODL allows peer-to-peer lending and borrowing directly between users. You go to the platform, you set your own terms, and you put up the offers depending on how long you want to borrow or lend and the interest rate. Go to lend.hodlhodl.com. A lot of people want to get involved with Bitcoin mining, but they don't have an easy way to do it. CompassMining.io are changing this. So if you go to CompassMining.io, you can select an ASIC and also a hosting facility to have that ASIC installed and operated. And there are mining facilities all around the world that Compass Mining have vetted. And then once you've done this, you can join a mining pool and receive Bitcoin. And of course, you still have to pay the electricity and operating costs. But this is a great way to get started without needing advanced technical knowledge to get started in mining Bitcoin. So go to compassmining.io and start mining Bitcoin today. On to the show with Adam. Adam, welcome to the show. So awesome to be here, Stefan. Great, great uh, to take the time. Glad to Glad to talk with you. Thanks so much for, for having me. I'm a crazy 2021, and this is a perfect time, I think, to, to talk with someone like yourself and kind of catch up and, you know, I guess, reflect. Yeah, for sure. And so when I first came across, you were Denver Bitcoin, and now uh, you're now Adam O. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you became Denver Bitcoin and how you got into all this Bitcoin stuff? And obviously, you've got a big focus on mining. So I want to hear a bit of your story there, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> De- Denver Bitcoin was not like something I intended to be, um, you know, like a, a, a pseudonym of mine, right? Like I didn't, it, it, the reason I made my handle Denver Bitcoin was because I figured I would be talking about Denver and I'd be talking about Bitcoin. Like that was literally my, my thesis behind the name. Um, and, you know, because with Twitter, it, it's good to talk about things that, you know, you're really passionate about. And there's an aspect of Twitter that's cool with like localization, right? Because like you can, you can catch live things happening, you know, in downtown where you didn't necessarily need to know what was happening, but then you see on Twitter, there's a music festival and it's like five miles away, you know? Um, so that's, I guess that was my reasoning behind it. The reason I came to Twitter was I, I'd, I'd found Twitter after I'd kind of already gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole a little bit, um, or at least I'd gone down it enough that I was really excited. And that, that happened when I was in the oil and gas industry in, in early 2018. So it was like, I think it was like late January, early February of 2018 is when I read, I was reading some articles about how you know, the, the bubble had popped because Bitcoin was crashing, right, from 20,000. It was, I think it had just passed, you know, 10 or 9,000. And so, um, you know, I was I was reading these stories and I had a good friend that had told me about Bitcoin years earlier. And so, you know, I, I actually kind of invest, went to investigate Bitcoin to, you know, just to figure out how the scam worked, right? And in my mind, I assumed it was a scam. And so I just went to go discover, 
the mechanisms of the scam. Like, hey, how, like, you know, who were the guys that pulled the wool over the eyes of a whole bunch of people with this Bitcoin thing? And so I figured, like, my assumption there was that the crux of the scam would probably be where wherever this thing is produced, right? Whoever's making these Bitcoins is probably the one that's like making out um, well scam, right? Like that's just kind of like my, in, you know, just my inherent assumption. And so um, that's, I went to go learn how Bitcoin was mined. Like what the hell is Bitcoin mining? What's the production of Bitcoin? And in that process, I learned how, I learned how thermodynamic laws are coupled with computer science and, and how, you know, no matter how efficient you make a computer or you, you make a, a, a circuit, I guess would be the way to say it, um, there's still some nominal amount of electricity that is required to execute the most basic function of a computer, which is a hash, right? Um, and you, we, in Bitcoin, we talk about hashes a lot. And so uh, when, I, when I understood that, like just, I mean, by the way, that wasn't a really hard concept for me to understand. It's not that, that, that complicated of a concept, right? It's like, hey, if you want a computer to do any kind of computation, you need at least a little bit of electricity. Like it might be um, an incredibly small amount, but you need some. And so like once I understood that, and once I really thought about that, I went, holy crap, like this is not a scam. This is this is an open and competitive energy market is what this is. Like, I mean, I saw it right there. Now, I was working in oil and gas. I was working with upstream oil and gas operators doing uh, production management and production accounting. Um, so I was dealing with like daily data capture numbers and dealing with all the all the different, um, you know, really there's, there's three things. There's oil, gas and water is what gets accounted for in the oil field. And so, you know, I was... I was learning about all the day-to-day -day productions of the oil field and how to account for these volumes and, and submit monthly reports. And so I was just getting really well versed in the energy industry just by happen chance that I was in this job. And then I learned about this Bitcoin mining thing and I went, holy cow, like I know where there's a ton of energy guys are just wasting because like they have they have no home for it, right? They have they have no means by which to to bring it to market for a profit. And so like all from there, all I needed to do was run the numbers of, hey, what what does it look like to convert you know, natural gas to electricity to this bit, you know, magic internet money stuff to dollars. Like, like, is that investment going to look at all attractive for oil and gas producers? So I set out to, to figure that out because I'm, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I'm not a petroleum engineer. Um, I didn't, I didn't know these things. Right. So I, the good news was that I had a ton of resources. I was in the oil and gas industry. And so I was tapping everybody I was speaking with. And inevitably, once I ran the numbers, I realized, holy cow, this is like, an, <laughs> you know, compared to a pipeline, right, investment, like this is very competitive. Um, maybe, you know, if, if you're, if you believe that Bitcoin has a value proposition, if you, if you see Bitcoin for what it is, in my opinion, then it's almost hard to compare a pipeline. Um, like, like mining Bitcoin almost looks more attractive, but actually let's, let's, let's jump onto that. I just want to understand a little bit there. So can you tell us what, what are the typical things people think about when they're considering a pipeline investment versus say, you know, how does that compare with a Bitcoin, uh, you know, investment? <laughs> um, well, it hardly, okay. So I'll, I'll say this. The, I mean, I'm, I'm bullish on Bitcoin, right? There, there's the thing about a pipeline that's really nice is you can, there's a massive amount of volume that you can push through a pipeline. Right. And so like a lot of the oil and gas wells, you know, we're talking about and not just oil and gas wells, but like gas fields, right. Like pads of wells. Um, like the, the volume of gas that we're talking about, a pipeline is really great because you need like that's the amount of gas needs to get to a, a dense populace. It needs to go to like Atlanta and you know Dallas and like be, be consumed because to generate power on site would be insane amounts of power. So there is that aspect of a pipeline. But when it comes to a Bitcoin mine, there's a lot of other benefits. Like one, it can be any scale, right? So like you can build a Bitcoin mine for just a little bit of gas, or you can build it for a lot of gas, right? When you're, when you talk with pipelines, like the aspect is this, if I just have a little bit of gas and in order to bring that gas to market, I have to build a, you know, hundred mile pipeline to connect to whatever the, the nearest, you know, main pipeline infrastructure is around me. You, all you do is run the numbers on that. You look at the cost and it's like, you know, $10 million. And then you look at the amount of gas you have and you'd say, oh, well, like in order for us to do that, we're, it's going to be, you know, 500 years before we make our money back, we're not building a pipeline. Um, like, so we're just going to burn the gas and keep producing oil. And so pipelines are really expensive. The reg it's regulatory hell to invest in, in pipelines and really producers. I mean, that's like the last thing that they want to do unless they are intentionally drilling gas wells and they already know that they're going to have to build that midstream. Like it's, it's not fun. And then if you have a leak, 
and somewhere in the pipeline, it, it could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars just to find the leak, let alone repair it, right? Like just to figure out exactly where the leak is in these 20 miles of pipe that are under the ground, you know, it's like, it's a nightmare. And so a Bitcoin mine is a really flexible way to sell gas. It's this way where, and then here's the thing, your well can stop producing. I mean, you can't just pick your pipeline up out of the ground and go put it somewhere else, right? And with a Bitcoin mine, you can, you can just pick up this modular infrastructure, right? Go drop it somewhere else. And so there's like this, this flexibility, this lack of counterparty risk that makes a Bitcoin mine potentially, you know, way more attractive than a pipeline. Uh, but that being said, people still need energy. And so these massive volume wells, like Bitcoin isn't there yet, right? Bitcoin isn't valuable enough to take all of the energy in the world and start mining it, right? I mean, it's just, we're not there yet. It's, it's, it's not even there to where we should take, we can take all of this waste energy, all of this excess energy, um, because it'll get to a point where the next marginal investment isn't attractive enough. We're like, yeah, they might be profitable, but it's not profitable enough. I'm, I'm probably better off spending money over here. I'll get a better return than I will, you know, mining Bitcoin with some, you know, out, out on my gas. And so it's really, it's really exciting things. Like when I mean, that's when, when all this kind of came to light, that's, that's when I um, stumbled upon upstream data and became a customer of theirs and quit my job and like went full force into this. And so that's when Denver Bitcoin really got, got born was later on that year. I think it was like August or September of 2018 when I got on Twitter. Cause every, every news article about Bitcoin brought me to Twitter anyway. Um, it was like, or it had a tweet embedded in the article. And so I was like, I guess apparently this Bitcoin culture lives on Twitter. Like I, I guess I have to make a Twitter account and in order to participate and like, you know, get up to date news on this. And so I made a Twitter account, which was not something like I, I wanted or planned to do. Um, but Twitter's ended up being amazing, right? Like the, the way in which to connect with people. I mean, it's effect, essentially how I was able to start a consultancy um, with, with oil and gas companies, um, which inevitably led me to, to the position I am you know, in today with, with upstream data, working with oil and gas producers, building out Bitcoin mining projects for, for these guys. I mean, it's, it's a crazy world, Stefan. I mean, I, we're, you know, it just the last thousand days of my life have, has been just a whirlwind, right? It's just been crazy. Um, let alone the Bitcoin price and, you know, in between there, right? And let alone my own like personal finances and everything else all in between there. It's just, it's a wild ride. Yeah, for sure. And it changes a lot of things about how you think in many different ways. And uh, I suppose, I mean, for you, you've come down the mining pathway. So how did you get involved with doing like when, what was it like when you started your own um, first, you know, mining, like I, I presume you would have started your own little operations before then yeah. actually expanding it out and selling it for other people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and I, I initially started just with the home stuff, right? Like I think much like a lot of people maybe do where they start in their garage, right? Um, and I started, I was actually using this, this Antminer V9 that's on nice. my wall here. It's a <laughs> horribly in, um, unprofitable machine right now. It, I think it only does like four terahashes per second and it pulls like 900 watts or something. It's, it's not, not a great machine. Um, but I needed to get my hands on something to tinker. I think I paid like 50 bucks for it. It came with the PSU, which I think the PSU alone, like it, that thing has to cost about 45 or 50 bucks to manufacture. Like just the materials alone are like 50 bucks. So, you know, I, I got it for free almost in a way. And so, um, you know, I started just with that. And when I, cause I, I had to get my hands on this, I had to kind of understand like what, what this actually is. And for me, I had to tinker with something like I have to feel it. And so, you know, I, I remember getting the V9, I configured it. I remember configuring it. This is this hilarious. I configured it to some to some mining pool, which I don't even think is around anymore. I don't. I can't even remember the name. Like they they went defunct because they were they were paying out. You know, they ended up paying out more than they were winning in blocks. And so, it's just you know one of those things. But I I remember configuring it and like I remember getting to the point where I I can I typed in like my stratum code and I reset the miner and then I saw my hash rate come live on the on like the interface and like then I saw my projected rewards for the day. And I mean, within like the first day of running my, a machine at my house and just getting that kind of intimate experience with what it's like to just mine Bitcoin, I realized really quickly, like, holy crap, this is so applicable to the oil field. Like this is, this is almost looks like it was made to be in the oil field. You know what I mean? Like it's, it seems almost designed for it um, because it's just a bare bones piece of, you know, circuitry hardware, right? It's, it's nothing fancy. They're not, not trying to be you know, necessarily, I mean, I guess with some of the newer stuff, you could say they are now with like the first, you know, the S19 pros and stuff, which are incredible pieces of technology, seven nanometers, but some of that old other stuff, you know, the 16 nanometers S9s, like 
it's awesome. Like I was like, man, the, the oil field is going to love this. I have to get involved yesterday. Otherwise I'm going to get cut out. Right. Cause in this current moment, right back in 2018, I was like, these, these oil and gas producers, they're not going to take any magic internet money risk. They're not going to spend a dollar on this machine. They don't, they don't care the circumstances. Um, but that's not going to last. I was like, that's, they're going to change their mind inevitably. So for the moment I can come in and provide value. I can say, Hey, I'll, I'll take the capital risk on all this weird hardware. You don't want to buy. You just need to let me come and buy your gas from you that you couldn't sell yesterday. Now you can sell it to me for maybe not what you would get, you know, at the market, but still way better than just burning it. And so when I, when you can come with the, to them with that proposal, then they were like, okay, like there's no downside for them, right? There's absolutely no risk for them. No money up front. Literally. It's just like, let me put this thing on your oil site at the end of the month, you'll get a check. And so that's exactly what um, I ended up brokering with, you know, through, through upstream data. Um, and then I had Steve Barber at upstream data build uh, the infrastructure that I'm still using today um, in the oil field and mining. Um, my dad was my business partner and he's a boomer. He's a, he's a 70 year old boomer. So investing with him was like, I mean, it has been a total ride, you know, it could going from, I mean, he thought he was going to lose every dollar of this investment. Like truly he invested the money, like willing to have lit it on fire yeah. essentially. And now he sees like this great utility and he's totally a Bitcoin bull. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's been a crazy thousand days. Like I said, it's just been wild. And so, but one thing I do know is that Bitcoin mining as a, as an energy technology, as a means by which to, to deliver energy to market, um, low friction is probably the most disruptive technology since the internet, I'd say arguably, um, like it's, it's as disruptive as like electricity itself in many ways, because it changes the entire kind of power generation and, and energy production game. Yeah. Let's, let's dive into that a little bit more. So why exactly is it going to change the broader energy market uh, in that way? Optionality, right? It's sheer optionality. So up until now, there's really only been one place to sell electricity and that's to human beings in populist centers right to the right? grid right um, yeah. to the grid right i mean there have been historical examples um not very many but there have been some examples of companies like microsoft and amazon um i think maybe even apple like they have done deals with oil and gas companies who had stranded gas wells um to to put data centers out in the oil field like out on a stranded gas well but those are circumstances where they're very specific it's like if you think about it, right, Microsoft, if Microsoft puts a data center somewhere, like there's a security aspect, like a physical security, you can't just have somebody walking in to the freaking building like anybody, right? Um, and then there's like the aspect of these, these data centers can't go down. Like they can't, they can't have no downtime because then people's phones stop working and billions of dollars gets lost. Um, like, so it's any downtime is unacceptable. Whereas Bitcoin is this whole new kind of technology, almost, almost different than you know, setting a Microsoft data center out there because it's completely flexible. You can um, you can turn it off, turn it right back on. Like nobody's affected. The network's not even really affected. Um, I mean, it, even if it is, because you're so massive, it's only in the short term. Um, but regardless, like it's a very flexible, autonomous market. And so the sheer optionality that now exists, where everybody in the world, whether you're producing hydroelectric energy, nuclear, solar, wind, no matter what, the fact that you now have a secondary market somewhere else to sell electricity changes your entire business plan. It'll change the way in which you, you build, right? You'll like the actual physical pieces of, of infrastructure you build as well as the footprint, but it'll, it's going to, it's going to change all of the economics, all of the projected economics for the better for all of them. Right. Because instead of now having to project out, you know, peak and trough demand um, and, and try to, plan out years of, of human electrical consumption, you can say, hey, no matter what, we know we're going to be selling, you know, this much electricity all the time, because even as the grid dips, you know, we'll, we'll sell it to Bitcoin mining. And then as the, as the peak demand on the grid goes up, right, we'll, we'll turn off some of our Bitcoin miners and provide the grid with everything it needs at a price that it's willing to pay. Um, and so every single energy producer is better off. But beyond that, now energy producers are incentivized to go out and find places where they have stranded assets or stranded energy sources like stranded geothermal, stranded hydroelectric, stranded natural gas. And as long as they can get an internet connection, they can create a downstream market for themselves. All they need to do is 
generate power and convert that power into computational work, which is a relatively easy thing to do today. In other words, they need to acquire ASICs, which they're not fully commoditized by any means, but they're relatively plentiful um, and they're becoming more plentiful um, by the day. That being said, we, we need a lot more ASICs. So we need a right. lot of semiconductor production. Yeah. We need some serious, some serious uh, money to be invested into, in my opinion, you know, erecting foundries and, and microelectronic fabrication facilities here in North America. But regardless, that's going to change everything. And one way where it's really, I mean, this is, Bitcoin is really powerful and, and it bleeds through the incentives of day-to-day -day, um, business activities and economic activities to a degree that's that's really striking. And, and one way that I think it's going to impact oil and gas that's kind of exciting, and I don't hear a lot of people talk about this, and, and maybe I'm a little bit, maybe I'm just too bullish on Bitcoin um, on this point, but I think it's truly going to change the way guys produce oil wells. Um, currently, when guys are fracking or hor like horizontally exploring for, for oil um, primarily, you know, they might drill a vertical well and then they're exploring horizontally. And if they, they discover, you know, an oil formate or if they're in a formation and they think they found some oil, they, they, they will sometimes inject the, the living hell out of that well, right? They'll, they'll inject a ton of pressure into that well. And what they're trying to do is blow off all the gas, right? They're trying to get all the gas immediately blow all the gas out of the well so that they can get to the crude oil because they don't even have a midstream. They don't even plan to sell the gas. This is an oil play. Um, and, and in that process, oftentimes what, what they end up doing is leaving a lot of hydrocarbons on the table when you look at the overall production of the well, where I think with Bitcoin, now they're going to be incentivized rather than to inject the living hell out of the well and go after that oil. They're going to slowly inject that well and they're going to seep out every cubic foot of gas and they're going to bring it to market by mining Bitcoin. And then once they've, you know, brought a, you know, a significant percentage of that gas to market and they've taken a lot of that pressure out of the well, then they're going to attack the oil. Right. And they're and then they're going to maybe inject harder, but it, they're going to be more patient in their production. Right. They're going to have a lower time preference. And what they're going to find is that over the total production of the, like the overall production of the well, the lifespan of the well, the overall production is going to be greatly increased you know, by, by double digit percentages potentially. And so, you know, it's crazy. Bitcoin mining is, is potentially going to incentivize energy producers to, to lower their time preference, be more patient um, and more maybe diligent, you could call it, when, when producing, um, because now they have a, me a mechanism by which to bring that to market and earn a profit from that diligence, right? It's not just virtue signaling and I'm saving the environment kind of things anymore. Regulators no longer need to hold a gun to their head and say, hey, you quit wasting this gas. The market's going to hold a gun to their head and say, hey, if you if you keep wasting this gas, you're a, you're a monetary fool and you're not going to be able to compete and you're going to get run out of business. Um, and so it's just like this really natural way for for efficiency um, to get pushed forward and for innovation to get pushed forward. And so I, I don't know, it's when, when people come in and I guess that's why, you know, I, I even engage in that in the argument of, of Bitcoin and its environmental impact was I was early on, I was seeing how positive Bitcoin's impact on the environment was, how how many layers deep it went. And so when I started seeing guys, you know, even in early 2019, middle 2019, talk about Bitcoin's environmental impact, I was like, I have to participate in this discussion. I have to bring bring my ideas to battle because I'm seeing something that maybe other people don't recognize, but it's it's far beyond just just finding home for some wasted energy it it changes a lot more than that and the outcome is a is a positive environmental impact so it's you know it's one of the probably one of the technologies that should be most celebrated uh by yeah. by those who call themselves environmentalists and yet it's ridic ridiculed and so a frustrating world we live in right <laughs> it's just how it goes yeah yeah so i mean it's really interesting you're saying there it's um a lot of it is around the yeah the ability to make projects work that previously would not have been possible. So it's this idea that you can set up a project and you know that you can now sell this level of uh, capacity uh, because if you, even if the grid doesn't want it, the Bitcoin miners want it. Right. Now, I, I, I suppose the challenge people might say, and they might be thinking this is, but hang on, what about the opportunity cost then? Does that mean I would have spent all this money to buy Bitcoin mining equipment, but now it's just going to sit idle? What, what, how would the, how would you, answer that kind of question? Well, no, that, I think that's certainly a factor of the discussion, right? I think that's how you appropriately scale your project is, I mean, if you're in a situation where you're selling to both the grid and um, the Bitcoin network, right? If you're, if you're 
essentially bouncing back and forth, right? And constantly switching the, the percentage of your total energy that's going to one or the other. What I would say is that you would want to properly scale it from the get-go and say, hey, like we should install this many Bitcoin miners so that it's likely for, you know, on average, 80% of them, 90% of them are running like, you know, 85% of them are running pretty much all the time. But then right when we get to peak demand, we're going to have to drop it down to like 20 miners. You know what I, you know what I mean? And that, like you would, you would get it to where the majority of the miners are on all the time. And then the other thing I would say is, well, maybe that would be, this would be a situation where you wouldn't, you wouldn't leverage the newest mining hardware, right? This might be a great, like that. And that's a lot of what I'm talking about with guys in the oil field that are using flare gas is, you know, they're talking, they, they come to me and they're like, Hey, can you get, you know, the latest and greatest ant miner S19 pro? And I'm like, yes, I can, I can supply that for you, but I don't recommend it. Right. Like, first of all, this is, this is your first time doing this. Um, so buying seven thousand, eight thousand dollar machines is it's, it's just a big risk, right? It's just some capital risk there. But beyond that, this is the oil field. Like your advantage is the fact that you have the most economic energy. You don't need to be the most efficient horse in the race. You've got you've got like almost free energy. So the S nine is efficient enough and it's durable and like you know. So like those kinds of conversations are what I have with the, with these oil and gas producers who maybe come in after doing their preliminary, you know, kind of Googling research. Maybe they've, they have some kind of understanding of, of what Bitcoin mining hardware is and what they're buying, but they have the idea that like, if they're, if they're not the most efficient machine, like they're, they're moments from being obsolete. And that's just, you know, like sometimes like, Hey, take a breath. Remember where you're coming from that for guys that are on the grid with eight, eight cent per kilowatt hour power. Yeah. They need, they need efficient stuff because like they run the numbers and, their price floor is higher and their their energy ceiling is lower. Um, when you look at guys in the oil field, like you don't have these issues. You, you don't have a an energy supply issue. So efficiency isn't your problem. You have a capital supply issue. So this, really what you need is your dollar to be efficient when you spend it and invest in this. And so maybe the older stuff is actually more appropriate for you. And, and like those kinds of conversations, this becomes a real technology to them when you, when you have those conversations with guys, right? It becomes, it's no longer just this magic internet, you know, it, like they just imagine somebody like in a dark room with all these little green lights everywhere, like coding with a black screen and like, you know, hieroglyphs on the screen. Like, it's not that. This is oil and gas producers, petroleum engineers, some of the smartest people on earth. They, they can learn how to mine Bitcoin. The user interfaces are not that challenging, um, albeit they're not the easiest things in the world. but I mean, these guys drill 7,000 foot holes and, you know, produce hydrocarbons, right? I mean, these guys are not, uh, they're not idiots. So, you know, we, our philosophy at Upstream Data is that upstream oil and gas producers ought to be the biggest miners of the future because they're in the position to compete, right? They're in the best position to be the most competitive because the amount of wasted energy in the oil field seemingly immeasurable, right? It's seemingly endless amounts of gas. Yeah. So it's really an excellent opportunity that you're outlining here for people who are in the oil and gas industry and really why they should be trying to learn more about Bitcoin and about Bitcoin mining, because, and obviously there's two main angles. One is to, you know, to get involved in Bitcoin mining themselves and well, they want to hold some Bitcoin. So they want to think, well, before I'm holding a large amount of Bitcoin on my balance sheet, or if as an individual, just personally holding Bitcoin, they want to know a bit more about this thing. What is the case for Bitcoin? And so I suppose that's all part of that journey as well. So has that been your experience as well when you are, you know, teaching people about Bitcoin in the who are from the oil and gas industry? What, what's that been like teaching them? It's been, I mean, here's the thing, like initially, for the most part, most of them are highly skeptical. Um, some of them, there's some younger oil and gas engineers on the team that like are kind of maybe in the closet kind of uh, Bitcoin bulls, you <laughs> in know? In the closet maxis. <laughs> yeah, in the closet Bitcoin bulls. Um, and, but for the most part, like they're, they're relatively skeptical and, and they like the, the fact that they don't have to take Bitcoin risk, right? They like the fact that they don't, that they could sell their Bitcoin at the end of every day um, into, into good old dollars, right? Which for them, it makes sense. But that being said, this is the thing, Bitcoin will teach all of us, Savan. And I, and, and I love that you brought up this point because there's, there's another point I really want to make on this, but you know, if you think about the oil and gas producers and we, and sorry, my, my dog's upset. Um, we, we had, we had customers, <laughs> we had customers that, um, you know, from back from 2018. So our customers back from 2018, 
they look like geniuses at the end of 2020, right? When, when Bitcoin's price is running up, they look like absolute geniuses. When, when Bitcoin's, you know, crashing, guys don't really think about them. So like they, in, the, in the mind of the oil and gas producer, you got to think if, if any of those companies that were maybe mining Bitcoin with their flare gas in 2020, if they were selling all their proceeds throughout the year, I'm sure that they got together in the beginning of 2021 and were like, hey, so maybe this year we only sell 75% because look, had we held just even 10% of what we made last year, when it ran up from 10,000 to 50, 60,000, like it would have been like we made, you know, $50 in MCF of gas, which is like 25 times better than the pipeline market. Um, you know, and so Bitcoin's going to train them. Bitcoin will teach them that, you know, it's probably worth holding some of this, right? If, yes, this is a great tool to go from gas that you can't find a market for to U.S. dollars, which is what you denominate your company's success in. But that thing in between, you might want to hold a little bit of it because, in fact, it's been appreciating the last, you know, 12 years. And so that, that's one way that they're getting taught. But a lot of the conversations I have with oil and gas producers, the, the part of the conversation I think that's the most exciting and really the part of this that gets me the most excited on a, on a long time horizon is I believe Bitcoin mining is going to kind of separate, you know, separate the, the doers from, from the guys that are just on cruise control in the oil and gas industry, right? The, the, the petroleum engineers, the oil and gas producers and, and exploration companies that take this technology seriously, that take a serious look at it and at least give it the level of seriousness that it's warranted so far. Maybe you could call it, what, $600 billion of seriousness, right, as a, as a market cap or something. Those oil and gas producers, those engineers who go out and figure out how to price a Bitcoin miner, right, so that they can look at an Ant Miner S9 and tell you whether or not right now it's overpriced or it's underpriced, they're going to be better oil and gas producers this decade than the guys that aren't, right? They're going to be able to do more with the exact same amount of hydrocarbons, right? With the exact same oil and gas well, they can bring more value out of that than, than the guy who has no idea what a, what a Terra hash is. Um, they're going to be better oil and gas producers. They're going to, the, the cream is going to rise and they're going to be able to ha take this and leverage it to their advantage, use that competitive advantage to beat out their competition. Um, and that's what I'm most excited for. I'm most excited to work with the companies and build for the companies that are, that are excited about taking this, this technology and beating out their competition this decade, because those are the companies that are calling me, right? Those are the companies that are looking at how they can do more, right? They're not complacent with their current oil and gas production and their portfolio. They're always looking at, at, you know, doing better. And as that happens, then the, then the entire industry comes because nobody wants to be left behind, right? Then, then everyone's afraid to be the people that can't compete. And then we have, we have an incredibly strong Bitcoin network and an oil and gas lobby that's on our side, right? Like who, who needs Coin Center when you've got the oil and gas lobby on your side? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, so it's winning more and more people to the cause, if you will. And so it starts with here's something that can solve a little bit of a problem for you. And then eventually it becomes, okay, this is now something you want to hold, as you were saying. And it starts small, obviously. They might only say, I'll keep a little bit of Bitcoin. And then slowly, okay, yeah. keep a bit more, keep a bit more. And eventually they get to a point where they just want to hold as much as they can. And as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of the uh, Bitcoin miners now are able to hold more of their Bitcoin because now the in vogue way seems to be to borrow against your coins or to borrow against equipment and not actually sell Bitcoins. Uh, but um, yeah, I guess right. that's a little bit of a different side of it. But I got, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so in terms of oil and gas, like where do you see it? What are some of the big stumbling blocks right now for people who are already in oil and gas and haven't gone down this pathway yet? Is it just that they are maybe closed minded or is it just that they don't know? Or what's the or do you think the market is not big enough yet? As in Bitcoin's market is not big enough yet? Um, I think I think Ted Cruz, as distasteful as it is to quote Ted Cruz, um, I think Ted Cruz actually said this just yesterday. He's, Regular, you know, regulatory um, clarity is the is probably what I would say the biggest hurdle, right? There's a risk factor there that this is the issue, right? And and here's a great example of it. So where where I'm currently mining Bitcoin, like where my current Bitcoin mine um, is, the oil and gas producer that operates the well that has um, 
vent gas that I'm that I'm our Bitcoin mine is consuming. They asked to to purchase our my Bitcoin mine at one point, right? Um, but then they were unable to because like apparently their business insurance would cancel them if they got involved with holding cryptocurrency mining equipment, right? Because the business insurance has no way to calculate that risk, right? So by their means, like they, from their point of view, you know, if, if a company is holding Bitcoin miners, like they could be involved in all sorts of horrible international criminal activity or, you know what I mean? I have no idea. Like apparently it's, it's beyond what they're able to, to calculate, right? That risk, at least currently, right? It's, it's too early. And so I think they're just too early. So they're hands off. They're saying like, Hey, we, we can't insure you if you do this. And so companies can't mine Bitcoin if they can't be insured, right? Because they can't do any other business if they're not insured. And so there's, that's, it, it's early, right? So there's regulatory unclarity. Insurance is a, is a massive issue, I think. Um, you know, if you're going to set out, if you're going to really scale this out throughout your production portfolio and your oil and gas wells. I mean, you're, po you're possibly talking about 10, 15, 20 million dollars of computer hardware out in, in an outdoor environment, right? Now, while you, out of stream data, right? The, the hash huts we build are all weather and, and will bear all insane environments of the oil field. But still, you want insurance, right? Because, you know, somebody backs a truck into the dang thing on one day, just, you know, the guy that picks up oil, like you, you just, you want insurance. And if you can't get insured, it's almost like a non-starter for a lot of these serious oil and gas companies. Um, the flip side of that coin that's kind of cool, the kind of maybe silver lining to that is, and, and one of the ways in which Bitcoin is just so unique uh, or is, is unique is the, the small mom and pop operators are kind of, it makes sense for them to get involved first, right? They're more inclined to take this risk because it's a bigger benefit to them. The risk of like maybe not insuring $20,000 of some equipment, you know, it's like they can't get insurance for that. They're, they're like, okay, taking the risk and maybe just, you know, the stuff breaking and they're out the money and like, you know, they're fine with that. Like the small mom and pop uh, oil and gas producers, I think are, they have a head start because they're just they're more inclined to to kind of absorb some of that risk that you know large corporations have way too much red tape to even talk about and so it's likely that we'll see smaller oil and gas companies integrate this more thoroughly throughout their production um before the bigger companies really come in and get serious about it but the thing is that once the big companies make you know make a move they they move really fast right and so like once they decide that they want to build this out that they're going to, you know, allocate this, this much of next year's budget to it. Like it'll happen really quick and they'll catch up fast. But, and, and I think we're just right before that moment. We're right at this exploratory phase. I think we're all, all oil and gas companies in the world right now in some way, shape or form are taking a serious look at what it's like to mine Bitcoin. What do the costs look like? What does the ROI, you know, ballpark me on ROI? Are we talking 10 years, five years, 200 days? Like everyone's at least doing some due diligence to get that information. A lot of them are pulling the trigger and starting with like a pilot project, right? Getting their feet wet. A couple of them are already like sold on this being, you know, a serious tool to, to leverage in the oil field. And they're incorporating it into all their on-site operations, right? Anywhere that they've got excess gas, they're making sure to go put a mine. Um, and so it's that Parker Lewis, you know, it's the, what is it? The gradually then suddenly, like we're at the then part, you know, like we're just at the end of gradually, just before suddenly um yeah in this moment of suspense right back to the show in a moment coinkite.com are the creators of my favorite bitcoin hardware wallet the cold card so with the cold card it's a specialized device used to hold your bitcoin private keys and to sign bitcoin transactions you can use the cold card as part of a single signature setup or as part of a multi-signature setup with multiple hardware wallet devices so the cold card works great with hardware wallets like spectre desktop electrum blue wallet or sparrow wallet with the cold card, you never actually have to directly plug it with a computer. You can plug it to the wall or you can get a cold power and power it with battery. And you use a micro SD card to ferry that information back and forward between the cold card and your computer or your phone wallet. So get yours at coinkite.com and use the code LAVERA to get a discount. Now, when it comes to your Bitcoin, make sure you are not just trusting in that piece of paper. Get a metal product like the Cypher Grid available from cyphersafe.io. The Cypher Grid is the best value metal backup product in the industry. You get everything you need for $59. It's got two stainless steel plates for all 24 seed words. 
You can lock it with a padlock, you get a tamper evidence seal provided, and an automatic center punch provided to punch in those words. And just like all Cypher Safe products, it's made from stainless steel, it's fireproof, rust proof, and waterproof. So make sure you or your loved ones can access your bitcoins if something happens to you. Go to cyphersafe.io and use the code LAVERA to order yours with a discount. In Bitcoin, we talk about removing single points of failure. And with your Bitcoin, you want to look at using multi-signature with Unchained Capital. Unchained Capital have collaborative custody, allowing you to create a two of three multi-signature setup. So you might have been thinking, well, one hardware wallet's enough. But remember, as that value rises, you need to start thinking about eliminating single points of failure. Even if you've got a hardware wallet, you're still exposed. For example, your wallet or its backup or even ourselves. With Unchained Capital, they have a concierge program where you can get set up with two hardware wallets sent to you and video calls to get you set up, even if you've never held your private keys before. So go to unchained-capital.com slash concierge and use the code Lavera to get $50 off. Now back to the show. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And so it just comes down to more and more people waking up to that aspect of it. Uh, and it, it also brings up that whole conversation around the energy mix of Bitcoin, right? Like, oh, how much is renewable? How much is, you know, and, and like this whole conversation about uh, fossil fuels. And uh, I think obviously some of this comes into the discussion around, you know, whether you view fossil fuels as a good thing, like a net good thing for humanity. Um, I know you probably have some thoughts on that. I mean, how could you not? Yeah. Yeah, how could you not? I mean, to sit there and say that fossil fuels are not a net positive for humanity is to just lie, is to just be a liar, in my opinion. I mean, I it's hardly even worth picking apart. You know, it's crazy. I, I'm looking around me right now, and I, I don't think there's anything around me that could be here if it wasn't for, you know, reliable economic electricity. And reliable and economic electricity is predominantly provided from fossil fuels like coal and natural gas um this is the predominant for predominant driver of the electricity that you know powers the world and no, none of this would have been manufactured without economic electricity none of it it sure, sure as hell wouldn't have been shipped to me i mean like i mean even dog food wouldn't be available at, at the grocery store for 20 bucks if electricity <laughs> wasn't abundant and if fossil fuels weren't um prevalent in today. I mean, it's just nuts for people to, to villainize them. I get, and, and here's the thing, like I, I'm no, I, I don't think there should be like zero, you know, regulation of, of all processes of oil and gas or something like, no. And by the way, I think oil and gas companies are much more stewards of the environment than people give them credit for. But yeah, there's definitely places where, where waste can be cleaned up. I think any waste, you know, everybody should, should look to, to mitigate waste or at least reuse or or um recycle in some capacity waste but gosh the benefit of fossil fuels i mean it's crazy that it's just absent of the conversation and and there's just been this brainwashing you know this mainstream narrative that just the the fossil fuel industry the the energy industry is just like these crooked mean guys in suits that just you know they just want to burn mother earth for profits is like the it's just not i mean i work with these people every day that is not who they are by any means um it's crazy to me uh so you know i I think the ESG narrative is is damaging. I think it's I think it truly causes a lot of harm, and it's it's tough to to measure the the negative externalities that arise from the bastardization of of incentives. But I mean, look at what fiat money does, right? I mean, ESG is just another kind of mechanism of that, right? Carbon credits, in my opinion, are it's more of an accounting scam than it is anything. Um, it's a means by which to just create this new column in the accounting book, and like that can offset all of these other economic losses because of these virtue gains that are measured in units of carbon. I mean, it's a very, I think it's, it's a very dangerous and damaging uh, incentive system. Right. And yeah, I hate kowtowing to it. I hate the idea that, you know, you have to talk about how like, like energy consumption as though it's a bad thing. I don't think consuming energy is immoral. I think energy consumption is amoral. Right. I think it's, you know, I've, if, if energy consumption is immoral, then literally every single person on the internet is just like, we're all just sitting on the internet, destroying the earth is what is what is going on in the mind, in the minds of these people. Like I, I, it's very bizarre to me. Consumption of, of electricity is not a bad thing. Um, and yet we've been told that, and I'm, I, it's, it's hard to, it's really hard to, to reverse it. Right. It's really hard to, to even get people to challenge the idea that consuming electricity is a bad thing for some reason. Like I, I don't, it's bizarre. Yeah. It, it seems that um, the, the narrative and the, the constant propaganda of, Oh, see, and of course, I don't agree with this, but they say things like, oh, see, we're going to transition away from fossil fuels to the supposed wind and solar. And it, it just seems very 
not aligned with reality because people no. are living in denial of what feeds them and clothes them and houses them and people just sort of virtue signal about what they wish the way they, the way they wish the world would be yeah i mean i wish that too rather than understanding you know technology that's in place i mean i wish i wish like it was just rainbows and unicorns too like you know i wish we i wish we could just put out a big old solar panel and then just easily distribute all the energy to the world and never, you know, like I wish that too. It's just, it's just not reality. It's detached from reality. Like you said, um, you're right. Like that's, it's like this kind of fairy tale idea, but everyone's going along with it. Everyone's like, yeah, we're, we're transitioning. We're going to be, you know, completely fossil fuel free by 2035. And I'm like, no, we're not like, no, we're not. Um, like, trust me, Boeing didn't just build jets <laughs> To, ha to decommission them in, in 10 years, like, no way. Um, sorry. Like, it's just not, it's, and all, honestly, what, what that would mean, it would mean for humanity to revert back to what, 18th century, 19th century lifestyle, right? Like, so what, we should all go back to burning logs every night? Like, like the emissions from that is going to be better? Um, like, like, I mean, what are we talking about here? Like, we have to, we have to create heat still. We have to generate power still. I mean, this is, you know, electricity is is the, the means by which we leverage technology. It's the means by which we improve quality of life. The fact of the matter is there are people today that still don't have electricity. There's people that are like billions of people that don't actually have economic and reliable electricity. Um, and I think Bitcoin is going to be the mechanism that, that gives them electricity, right? I think it's going to be the incentive to generate power because you can earn a profit. Um, that people are going to go and provide these emerging communities and remote communities that don't have electricity with electricity because until they can consume it, you can mine Bitcoin, right? So you can erect a solar plant and you can use it, you know, predominantly, maybe 100% of your power in the beginning, you're mining Bitcoin with it. But then slowly as you build out infrastructure for this, this community and maybe become able to consume electricity, you can then taper off, right? And then you can relocate your Bitcoin mine to the next place you're going to do it. Right? There's going to be a, a capital incentive to go do this really good thing, to, to go provide electricity to a market that doesn't have it, right? to supply what isn't, what isn't meeting demand. Um, where now, the only time that that happens is through, is through like the Gates Foundation. right? And then the Gates Foundation like, has, their, has their thumb on this community. And it's more of like a a mafia relationship because really the Gates Foundation is, do, is doing this at a loss, right? They're burning money every year to provide electricity. And so if they leave, nobody else is going to come in and replace them. And so everybody's like, please don't leave. We want the electricity. Well, with Bitcoin mining, like if the person that comes in and provides electricity behaves tyrannically and, and tries to cheat the system that way, well, somebody else will come in and just outcompete them, produce power at a better rate, right? Leverage Bitcoin in order to do it at a better rate and put them out of business. And so it makes people play fair. It makes the upstream oil and gas producers play fair, right? The, the pipeline companies in the oil and gas industry, pretty much since the beginning of time, since the beginning of oil and gas, have been able to walk up to the producers and say, hey, listen, I, I've got a pipeline here. Like, you're going to sell me your gas and you're going to sell it to me at this price. Otherwise, like, you know, screw off because what are, what are you going to do with it? All, the only the other thing you can do with it is burn it. And now the oil and gas producers get to come to the table and they say, hey, pipeline company, if you don't give me a good price for my gas, I'm just going to mine Bitcoin with it. Like, I don't need your pipeline anymore. I have a market that'll pay me this. And so if you're not going to pay me something comparable, I don't need to do business with you. And just that sheer optionality is going to make is going to make the midstream. It's going to make everybody have to play more fair. Um, and it, I think it's going to bring up the market to to a higher equilibrium. Right. Like, I think what we're going to find is is greater efficiency. Um, the consumers ought to win. The producers ought to win. It's beautiful. Right. It's free market. Yeah, so that's a really interesting way to put it. And so, yeah, it's really about in negotiations, it's about what's your alternative. Exactly. And because now there is an alternative, it actually makes it a lot better for that. So I guess in some ways, it's weakening the power of the pipeline owner and helping the oil and gas producer in some way. Yeah, yeah. And, and it gives the upstream producer, you know, another tool, right? Like gives them a little bit of some or at least something else to bring to the table, right? Um, but I, you know, I think Michael Saylor has said this before, but he was talking about it from from like a you know the billionaire or a company's point of view, where if you know the bank treats you poorly, you can now just say, okay, bank, like I'm just going to take my 10 billion or whatever, and I'm just going to move it over here. Like you no longer get have my have my Bitcoin, right? So you now get to respond to being treated poorly in the marketplace. You have just that just that optionality, just the threat of being able to move your money changes how the bank treats you. In the same way with oil and gas, right? Just the optionality, just the fact that these producers could potentially go go buy a Bitcoin mine instead of sell to the pipeline, 
is going to change the way that those discussions go. And yeah, it's, it's a real, I mean, and this is, I, I got to imagine it's happening across other industries that I, I'm not even aware of yet, right? Like this is, Bitcoin bleeds through all day-to-day -day economic incentives. It's, it's this very, like, I guess, um, insidious kind of signal. I guess the signal, right? It's an economic signal in, in the minds of every, of every yeah. participant in an economy, right? So it's just pure signal out there. And I mean, oil and gas producers can't deny it. They can't deny the price in the sky, right? When, when Bitcoin is at $50,000, they had to pick up the phone and figure out if they should be mining, like if this mining Bitcoin thing is serious, because no matter how many great arguments you tell them, they look up at that number and that's going to be the strongest argument of all. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, I've mentioned it before, but so many things in this space are indexed to the price, whether we like yeah. it or not. Yeah. Number go up, drives developers, hash rate, more, you know, wallet downloads, podcast downloads. All of these things are basically indexed to the price. So as the price runs up, more people get interested. And so even if we don't like some people don't like the kind of overly price pumpy moon boy behavior, some of that is a bit you know over the top, but fundamentally number go up does drive a lot of these other things. And, you know, we believe it will drive freedom go up and number of people going up as well. So I think that's probably the interesting point and question as well around oil and gas and what it takes for more of them to get into this. And of course, the smaller Bitcoin is as a market, the less interested they are, but the bigger it becomes, well, now it's starting to make a lot more sense for them to actually get involved, right? And so I guess it's all a matter of time. Yeah, and, I, and yeah, the risk, risk decreases as price goes up, right? It's one of those counterintuitive kind of anomalies with, with Bitcoin where the, the bigger it gets, the, the less scary it becomes, um, at least to the investor, maybe the more scary it becomes to the regulator. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think the most powerful manipulator in the room is price and nothing's going to change that because I, like I said, I mean, I, I was going around 2018, um, my boss, Steve Barber, I mean, even earlier than I was, I mean, just getting laughed at by the oil and gas guys initially, right? Like, I mean, back in 2018, when you talked about mining Bitcoin in the oil field, it was, it was a, a humorous topic for like 99.9% .9 of the people in the, in the industry. And obviously, as it kind of should have been, right? Like, yeah, that idea is just like, oh, really? Like, that's going to be this magic internet money is going to, it's going to come infiltrate oil and gas. Okay. But then here we are, like, here we are. And this is really serious. The most serious oil and gas producers are looking at this. Um, and the, the greatest outcome of all is Bitcoin is going to become, I mean, far more hardened uh, and far more decentralized geographically, right? The hash rate will be much more spread out than it has been the last, you know, five years significantly. I mean, like China kicking out all the miners, a gift from God. I mean, I'm not, sh I don't see where it's, where it's some kind of an attack vector or like it's a long con of some sort. I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but as far as I can tell, it was just a gift from the heavens and we should all celebrate it. And in celebration, bring on some hash rate here in North America, because like, you know, the, the future is ours now, right? I mean, if they, if they just quit the game, like this is the best time for, for these oil and gas producers to take a look at this and get started because they they have significantly less competition than they would have four months ago. Yeah, yeah. And also wanted to get your thoughts on the Bitcoin Mining Council because I know oh, yeah. this is also a big topic in the industry. And so I guess maybe let me let some of the, I'll lay some of the found foundation a little bit for people. So I guess some of the arguments here are around this idea. Now, uh, Michael Saylor and others in the Bitcoin Mining Council might frame it like, okay, it's it's about education. We're trying to just form an educational council to teach people, hey, this is what Bitcoin mining is. Uh, and they're trying to disclose statistics about the percentage of Bitcoin mining that is, quote unquote, sustainable. And I think the number I've seen thrown around is about 56%, meaning either usage of wind and solar hydro or where they're, they've paid for a carbon offset. Um, so what's your, I guess, kind of thought on that idea is there value to that idea of having a voluntary open bitcoin mining council i think there's value to the idea listen i think i think it's possible the mining council is made in complete good faith with complete you know i guess um altruistic and and altruistic intentions rather than malicious intentions i don't think that that's their goal was to become the the mafia regulators of the industry by any means um but it's just one of those one of those things where it's a slippery slope, in my opinion, where it get, it's it's a fine line, right? It's a real you quickly cross over the line between, hey, we just want to we just want to know 
what percentage of your Bitcoin miners are on quote unquote renewable energy um, so that we can report accurate data so that people can have you know information and so that we're transparent and and how we're you know conducting this in, this new industry. There's a fine line between that and hey, we need to know what percentage of your miners are renewable. Otherwise, we're shutting you down, right? Or otherwise, like you can't be a part of the the carbon reduction mining council. And if you're not a part of the carbon reduction mining council, you don't get the carbon reduction mining council credits at the end of every month. And if you're trying to mine without these carbon credits that this council is now releasing to incentivize people to mine on renewable, then you can't even really mine. Like you, you could end up fucking up a lot of things, and you can you can screw up the incentive structure of Bitcoin pretty well by creating, I mean, by creating carbon credits, honestly, if you think about it, if really, if a ton of oil and gas, or not oil and gas, sorry, sorry, if a ton of upstream energy producers get involved in mining Bitcoin with wind and solar, and they're getting a ton of carbon credits from the government, they're essentially being subsidized to mine Bitcoin, right? And so if they're being subsidized to mine Bitcoin, they could scale to the point where you, unless you, unless you have like essentially free energy, um, you can't mine Bitcoin without a subsidy, right? Because these guys are essentially mining at a loss in terms of their power, but their subsidy brings them above, you know, brings them into profitability. I mean, that's, that's where you, that's called deadweight loss, right? That's called creating deadweight loss in a market. And um, that's what the government does best. And so at the same time that I think, I don't think that these guys have bad intentions. I don't hold any grudges against them. I think that the possibility of this becoming something worse and, and, you know, iterations of it to some degree, it's scary to me. Right. And, and I, I like to, I, I honestly, don't like that risk. Um, and so like, I, I'm, I think I might err on the side of, yeah, it may do more harm than good, yeah. but I, I'm not going to argue that it does no good because I think there's definitely some good that it can definitely, I mean, like certainly some good that can be done from that and right. And some clarity. I mean, obviously look at how freaking ignorant the lawmakers are in the United States. I mean, they're literally regulating an industry that none of them understand and they admit that they don't understand it, but they're going to regulate it anyway. I mean, so obviously like, I mean, it's one of those things like, sh should we even have, should we have a Bitcoin only lobby? Right. I think obviously now it seems like we should. Like, how did this stuff get in the inf infrastructure bill and come out of nowhere? Like, I thought the, there were crypto lobbies in Washington. Like, what the hell happened? Um, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm I'm all over. I, I'm sitting here like I, I'm not sure if it's futile or if if it's worthwhile. Like, it seems to me to be futile because obviously, look, like they make the, the, the rules to their own game and they don't care if they even understand what they're regulating. So, yeah, hard to argue that we should spend money and time discussing with these people. Like, maybe we should just build out our industry and, you know, and then fight them once they arrive. Right. Yeah. So which I think I guess is about now. OK, a few things I wanted to add there. So one interesting point, I think touching on the point around the Bitcoin Mining Council, I think it's one of those things where I, I agree that there might be a future risk there, because as an example, this is probably a good example. Uh, Sir John James Calpathwaite, a uh, British civil servant, and he was the financial secretary of Hong Kong from 1961 to 1971. Um, and so he has a really interesting example because do you know why? He did not want to keep government statistics, and he was famous for this. And the reason for that is because he knew that government technocrats, when they had these statistics, would try to manage them. And so I think it's a, if we, obviously you can see where I'm going with this, right? No, that's it. No, you're right. That's a, no, you're right. And so that's a, that's a great example. And this is something that libertarians speak about as well from an economic statistics perspective, because they say, look, if you give all these economic technocrats, this statistics and this data, they're going to try to manage it. Right. And so in the same way, if we're out here saying, oh, look, guys, we're 56% renewable in terms of the US mining, et cetera. Well, Guess what? Some politician years down the line or some regulator years down the line is going to say, huh, it's 56%. Well, that's not enough. We need 90%. And if you're not renewable, if you're not wind and solar as preordained by the green church, you're not allowed to operate. Or maybe they'll, they'll uh, apply pressure on the loans. And maybe they'll, say, they'll apply press, pressure through the financial system and say, hey, exactly. you're not allowed to give them loans and credit unless they are preordained green. And so exactly. this is potentially where the angle and the risk could come in. Um, so well, that's and, and to that point, and to that point, Stephen, <laughs> we're already there, right? Like I just, I had a phone conversation last week with an oil and gas producer, a good, a good friend of mine uh, here in Colorado. And he's currently drilling wells. And not many people maybe kind of know how this, how this works, but companies that go out and kind of explore for wells, right? They go out and they try to raise money so that they can drill, right? And so like they have a budget that they want to get to and he said, he literally told me, he's like, listen, the issue, he's like, the reason I like this, this Bitcoin mining idea is not necessarily because of the money that we're going to make. He's like, but because of the ESG, right, of the environmental aspect. And he's like, not because the regulators are penalizing us, 
but because unless we have a sexy ESG story, we can't get any money. Nobody will invest in us because we're the dirty oil and gas industry. And so in order to invest in the dirty oil and gas industry, people will only invest in the companies that have the sexiest, greenest, cleanest story of this dirty industry, right? And so they're only investing in the cleanest, you know, newest kind of uh, oil and gas producers. And so the reason that he likes this is just so that he can turn around and get money so that he can go drill oil wells. He doesn't really care much about, you know, mining Bitcoin at all. Like he just wants money to go drill oil wells because that's what he is. He's an oil man, right? I mean, he's a producer, um, but he can't get the money unless he sells these guys a sexy story. And so when I, when I told him this, he's like, I like this story because I can tell it to these guys and they'll like the story and give me money. And so it's just this, which is just a big virtue signaling game. It's nonsense. It's like, no, no, hold on. People should invest in this technology because it's, it's really worth investing in. Like there's not, you know, the, the saving the planet and saving humanity points aside, like this is great technology. Um, but you're right. That's exactly, it's already happening, right? We're, we're oil and gas producers right now are having a hard time getting anybody to invest in them, whether they're coming from, like hedge, they're, they're look, asking for you know hedge funds to invest or banks or whatever, unless they have a sexy, I'm saving the planet, I'm green story. And so it's already happening. We're there, right? So I'd say, the, I mean, historical data has shown us that the risk is 100% that that such a such kind of a council could become corrupt. Um, and I, 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 like, I like that uh, government statistics one too, because on the surface, right, the initial reaction to saying we shouldn't do government statistics is like, why wouldn't we want the information that's so foolish like be ignorant to the data but you're right like inevitably it just becomes this manufacturing of statistics rather than you know statistics are trying to push a story rather than reflect something that's already happened or taking place it's exactly the metric becomes managed and so then exact metric becomes managed right. so that's one way to think of it and i i look in fairness I can't, we can't expect people like Michael Saylor to be out there 100% towing the anarcho-capitalist libertarian line, which, you know, I, you know, obviously we might like that, but we don't know, you know, he's got a different aspect that he has to represent. But it could also be true to say that it's maybe it's just part of what is helping Bitcoin grow larger and then, it, it, you know, it might just not matter in the end. Like, let's say in 10 years time, if Bitcoin has just grown that large, it, it might just be, it might have become an unstoppable train by then. So... Who knows? Well, yeah. I mean, I think cooling about Bitcoin is it's got this this unique quality where it only it only attracts enemies that are just too small to crush it. So, like, like it only attracts the, the U, like the government right after it became big enough to defend itself against the government. You know what I mean? Like, because the government, I think the U.S. government specifically, could have crushed Bitcoin in 2013. Like, I truly think they could have like destroyed this thing and probably like sent it packing for good. Uh, maybe it would have you know, popped back up somewhere else, but they, they probably could have thwarted it pretty good. Um, maybe 2012, but now no, there's no way. Right. And so it's like, by the time Bitcoin's enemies even, even realize it, it's too big to fight. And that's one of the, I don't know, it's just like this perfect balancing quality of Bitcoin is that when it's, when people don't care about it, they could crush it, but they don't care to. And then when they want to crush it, they can't. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it is still like the, if you thought of the U S budget security spend, it's, it would be higher than Bitcoin's, obviously, much higher than Bitcoin's security spend. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, they wouldn't necessarily be able to go and get, like, acquire that many ASICs to try and commandeer the network or right. try to DOS the network because there's a constraint there on that too. But I guess it's a complicated story. Like, Well, and yeah. the energy. Yeah. I mean, where do you get the energy, right? I mean, like, to try to get that much energy in one place, like, is really hard to do. Like, I mean, when we're talking about gigawatts of power, like, there's not just gigawatts everywhere. And so, like, you know, actually erecting these things takes time. And, and at this point, I mean, that's what I think about Bitcoin security. Like sometimes when people say, you know, hash rate is equal to security, like kind of, but I think there, it's like, it, it's kind of like a step system where, where once Bitcoin's at like 100 exahashes or 200 exahashes, it's not like 220 exahashes is 10% more secure, really. Like really 200 exahashes is just like beyond attack, like beyond what's possible to attack. So it's secure, like, checkbox not like secure on a spectrum right so you're thinking of it more like a binary yeah more binary right. it's more binary in my opinion than it is a spectrum because like i mean once you're at like a, a, a you know what is it a, a a zeta hash right right once we get to a thousand exahashes like it's not like another x you know 100 exahashes really does all that much to the security um but yeah it's it's kind of the binary aspect and right now i'd say it's beyond attack right um 
plus there's just so many people paying attention to Bitcoin, so many people actively operating nodes, like not just passively having a node running, but like they're operating lightning nodes or whatever. And so the node operators really are the gatekeepers here, right? So even if somebody were to to get that much power and hash rate, like I, I think they'd fail. Um, I, I mean, I, I truly believe that they would fail and they'd waste a lot of money doing it and Bitcoin price would plunge probably, but then it would recover because it'd be hard. I mean, it's, it's hard. So, you know, it's, I think we're about to learn really quickly though, that there's only like one government hard money out there and all these other ones are really subject to regulators will. And we might see, like, we might see a fight here. Like, I mean, with this recent infrastructure bill, like it's, we're kind of at the point now that I think, I think Marty Bent said it, it was like a shot that was the shot that was heard around the world. Right. Um, yeah, a couple angles here. So I think yeah, it's, it it might be one way to think. That, now, of course, I you know, I believe in you know anarcho capitalism, libertarianism. So I certainly don't want to see. I, I you know believe in the free market and fully privatize everything. But I, I think maybe some are thinking of it like, oh, don't engage at all. Or maybe you, maybe you you should if it's if it's in like a low cost way that you can concurrently employ every strategy available to you. So of course, open source software, open source hardware, development effort, Bitcoin businesses, absolutely, that should be the main focus. But would it like, is it the end of the world to make some phone calls or to maybe put some money into Bitcoin lobbying to, to at least try to stave off the worst of it? That's, I, I guess that's my perspective. What do you think? No, I mean, I'm, I've been battling back and forth with that the last few days. And even because like the last couple of days, I gave some crap to Coin Center um, on Twitter, you know, and, and like I got some pushback from from some people and people that I respect greatly, you know. Um, and I don't know. I keep I go, I go back and forth on this. I mean, it's fun. I I have a really hard time. I mean, I have a hard time buying chairs, right? I have a hard time buying shoes for myself right now, rather than just buying some Bitcoin. And so the idea of like donating to a lobby, I would really need to be like they. It would need to be an individual that. I spoke to, you know, one-on-one -on -one and, and they compelled me, right? Like they, they gave me a really good reason as to why me specifically as to how it's going to impact me or, or, you know, mining in the oil field. Right. Um, and how they're specifically going to like, you know, their plan to approach it. And, and it made sense to me because as far as I'm concerned, like, I'm not really sure what lobbyists, like what their, their, their methods of, of trying to push regulation are. Um, and so for me, it's almost, it seems to me like kind of like a black hole of money where you just like you, companies just dump money into this thing. You know, they, they always just allocate half a percent to for lobbying. And so they're going to, you know, if you're the one of only three lobby companies in this industry, you're going to get some money and then you don't really have to do much because Washington sucks. And so nobody's going to blame you when you come back and just say, oh, the crooked guys, Pat, you know? So it's like, just kind of like, there's like full, they have full, kind of deniability of results, right? And I don't like that. I don't like putting money towards something where people can have full have full pre-planned excuses as to why they don't need to deliver anything. Um, so I, I go back and forth on that. Uh, that being said, I obviously with what just happened in Washington, we we got to get we we need some voice. I mean, I would I would give my voice to it, right? If um, I've, I've spoken with with some people that are you know looking to start a Bitcoin only lobby. That reached out to me and, and I said happily I would yeah you know like speak on behalf of what we're doing and why I think regulation could stifle some really great things that, that are going on with Bitcoin mining but obviously we haven't had very many compelling or intellectual people give those arguments in Washington because these guys have no idea what the fuck is going on with I mean and we had no idea that this was coming so I, I'm a results guy right and the results I see right now are pretty are pretty loud so yeah and so the money spent so far seems to not have been very well spent. So I'm, I'm, I have a hard time thinking about donating, you know, given, given the results. Right. Yeah. So, so absolutely. I think a Bitcoin only lobby would, I think a lot of Bitcoiners would feel more comfortable donating money for that, as opposed to be always in the back of their mind, wor worrying if there is some shitcoin apologia going on as well. Yeah. They're out there trying to get like. And yeah. NFT legislation, like, yeah, like, I don't care about NFT legislation, yeah. man, like, I really don't. And uh, look, maybe the other, but I, I think it's also fair to say that, you know, this bill got held up because of all the, the lobbying. So maybe it's, it's, a, it's a lobby that's going to grow over time. And True. we could argue that potentially politically, Bitcoiners become more powerful in that sense. So maybe it's not necessarily just the lobbying, but it could also be politicians that have to try to I hope so. uh, cater to the Bitcoiner. Yeah voting base, if you will, that they might. So, you know, obviously people like Senator Cynthia Loomis, obviously is probably at the top of that Absolutely. list uh, and other, you know, and other prominent voices. So maybe there might be more people like her. And she's great. Uh, coming out of this. 
Yeah, and I think there's game theory here, right? I mean, the government's made up of individuals. And so these individuals are, they benefit from Bitcoin's characteristics just as much as I do. Um, and so, you know, and not to mention, they get to work on the game of, of regulating it. So they get to buy a whole bunch of it and then they get to come together and say, oh no, by the way, we're going to totally let Bitcoin be like viewed as a currency and then price pumps and they get rich. I mean, I'm, I, I totally think Bitcoin will kind of, you know, do the same thing to their minds as it's done to everybody else that plays this, this game theory. But and, and I do agree with you. Like, I hope that the maybe politically Bitcoiners voice becomes more powerful and more, or I guess more politicians are inclined to listen to the you know concerns of this industry, of this community. I think maybe for me personally, it's just, I hate that game yeah, so yeah. much. I'm probably not going to be the one that participates a whole ton in it. Um, I just, I, it's just so, you know, I, I really like doing honest business. I, I, you know, I value honesty and character probably above most other things. And like in Washington, <laughs> Um, and with politicians, you don't oh, get that, man. Like you get a whole, it's, it's all a facade. It's a lot of saying, it's just, you know, it's, yeah, it's just all saying things and getting elected, you know, saying that, saying the thing yeah. to, to either get into power or retain power. But, but here's the point. Like, of course I'm, I'm with you. I think, you know, but you're right. We have to play the game. Like it's either, if we, if we don't participate, we're, we're going to get wrecked. It's, it's like, you might not be interested in politics, but politics might be interested in you. No, exactly. No, I, yeah, I get that. Right. And, and right, so, you know, it's part of the reason I want to, I'm probably going to be like in <laughs> Wyoming or South Dakota here soon. And like, you know, I, I want to be left the hell alone as much as, as much as anybody else. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and I don't, I don't like think that people that are putting effort toward, toward that are bad. I mean, I honestly like good on you. That's fantastic. I, I like, I don't have <laughs> I, I maybe I just have more disdain for for some of these these regulators than others, um, and I, it's just really hard for me to give them my hard earned money, right? I mean, they're already taking so much of it. It's like it's hard for me to to spend money to, because I, I I really don't know if that's how the impact happens. That's why I said I'd absolutely lend my voice or my time, right? If like if I could give a testimony that might be shown, you know, to to lawmakers, um, you know, personal experience from the industry, I would happily do that. It's hard for me to just give money because. You know, I, I don't know. It's like, I, I feel like I'm I'm yeah. accommodating this. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think part of it is like... Lobbying game of nonsense, you know? I don't know. It's, it's like, I, there's got to be a better way. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's sort of... I think we all have somewhat conflicted feelings because at the same time, it's like, it's a dirty game, but there are some people who are willing to get their hands dirty to go play in that game, to at least try to tip things in the Bitcoiner favor, arguably. So yeah. it's, it's a hard thing. Yeah, yeah. Good, good on them, I guess. You know, good, I mean, good on them. And, and if they've got the talent for it, like awesome like i hope i wish them all the success in the world right i'll benefit from their success so i i definitely don't don't want like bitcoin lobbyists to fail by any means of course not um i'd, I'd love to see some some leg like regulation of of over oversight of bitcoin that was logical right like things that actually made sense right so that we were we were defending against things like oligopolies and you know and, and market manipulators rather than defending against you know yeah. things like innovation <laughs> right rather but than i think at the at the end of the day you know stifling yeah. that like let's let's cycle monsters you know yeah the, but the way the way i would put it is is more like we don't even necessarily need uh government regulation of market competition to have perfect competition and things like that what we but i think no we don't like no you know but i guess bringing it back to the main point really is most of the work is in the open source software open source hardware bitcoin mining education like that's where most i think that's where most of our effort should be but maybe a little bit of effort or money or resources or time as disgusting as politics is i think you might you might as disgusting you as politics me. is you, you might know? have convinced me that as disgusting as it is as disgusting as it is i mean i will say you know worst case silver lining is that it reminds me of you know why bitcoin is so awesome because it it renders a lot of this nastiness obsolete um in many ways right and at least or at least hopefully takes away a little bit of power from from these swamp creatures that uh that just print money at will without any without any thought of it you know it's it's i, I like that you brought this up because the overarching point is this we all want bitcoin to succeed and i think we all i think for the most part most most people that understand bitcoin think that bitcoin will succeed whether or not there's thoughtful regulation around it or not um it's just the point a to point b what's the path Right. So this is the thing. I think inevitably central banks and the politicians that they own currently um, aren't going to go down quietly. And if 
Bitcoin truly renders their money printing obsolete and really, I mean, that takes away all of their power. Um, I don't think they're going to go down without kicking and screaming and, and doing some really, really right. crazy things like right. crazy regulation, making Bitcoin yeah. illegal kind of things, right? As, as the last ditch efforts, right? But maybe I'm, maybe I'm out of bounds. Like, you know, it's like, oh, they can't go from, you know, regulating it and calling it a money and recognizing it as a currency. And then all of a sudden just I'm like, yes, they can. Like they absolutely can. Have you ever heard of emergency measures? Like, have you not seen the last year? Like they, they can't just tell you that you, you know, they can't make you show them that you're vaccinated. But fucking yes, they can. Like, yeah, <laughs> like they, they will. Um, you give them an inch and they'll take a light year. And so, yeah, whew, I don't know. I, you're right. I mean, I, maybe, maybe I should, I'm gonna think more about that. I think, I'll tell you this. I mean, if if the right person, you know, approached me, if if I truly saw somebody that that said, "Hey, I, this is our course of action for how we plan to get this regulation in place, and this is why we think it's going to be helpful. This is, you know, how we plan to do it." Like, it'd be hard for me to not, yeah, yeah, you know, support that. But what I see right now, it's just kind of like, yeah, throw them money and hope for the best. And I'm like, I don't, I don't play that game. Yeah, yeah, and and I think to reflect maybe the point that say, you know, our friend Marty Bent would say is. That it's not just that, yeah. you know, Bitcoin is going to be fine. What we're talking about here is if you care about your local country jurisdiction and the people who are doing the Bitcoin development, Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin education, whatever, in that country, they're the ones who might suffer. Yeah, And people. if you want your country or your area to do well, that's where you have to be able to, as disgusting as it is, maybe have some political engagement or some lobbying engagement to try and exactly. stave off the worst of it, to give Bitcoin more of a chance to grow uh, until it gets too big to like just realistically too big for anyone to really stop this thing. And for and too many people involved for it for you know the people to allow it to to become like you know public enemy number one because too many people are winning off of Bitcoin right too many people are are benefiting from from it so I don't know I mean that being said it's also really like the regulators it's also really easy for them to you know put in a couple short positions and then get together and ban it and, you know I mean? <laughs> it like, is. It, it's so easy for them it's so easy for them to like rig the game in their favor i mean like pelosi you know with her tesla buys and stuff right before like they they pass law that teslas are going to be used for government cars it's like come on like how the hell is this legal um but i guess they get to they get to live in that world and we we just <laughs> it's their world we're just living in it <laughs> <laughs> yeah but look i think the broader message though that i see is that bitcoin is growing bigger and i i just don't see it being stopped at this point and so no. there's a massive opportunity for people whether you are holding bitcoin whether you are mining Bitcoin, uh, there's just so much opportunity to come in this next, oh, yeah. call it five to 10 years as the industry is you know, really going to that next level. So uh, do you have any closing thoughts for listeners out there if they think about how they should get involved or maybe if they're in the oil and gas industry and they're thinking, okay, this guy's talking about Bitcoin, what should I, what should I do? What's my next step? <laughs> well, definitely check out upstreamdata.ca. That's, that's, I think the coolest stuff that's going on in the oil, oil and gas industry is there. I'm right along you know, with Marty Bent over the great American mining and stuff. They're awesome guys doing awesome stuff. Um, you know, I think off of what you just said, one of the one of the kind of closing points I'd like to make is that right now is a time of overflowing opportunity, kind of like what you mentioned, not just in Bitcoin, really in the world and, you know, with the internet, but definitely in this industry. And it's one of the driving reasons as to why it's so easy for me to, or like why I guess I, it's it's crazy to me to think about these, you know, people going out and scamming and making, you know, vaporware tokens and dropping them on people because, you know, if you want to make an honest buck, like if you want to truly make an honest, you know, make an honest dollar, make some, create some honest value, there's so much opportunity to, to do it today that all you got to do is go learn about whatever you want to do, right? You just have to go be passionate about it and dive in, start talking about it. Um, and it probably won't be very long before you're getting paid <laughs> to talk about it and do whatever it is you like to do. And so like, you know, I, I would just encourage people that, that maybe you're sitting there thinking like, man, I want to get involved in this industry. I don't know where, don't know how. I would just say, what part interests you the most? Go obsess over it and talk about it and get, you know, talk to everybody who knows anything about it. And I think what you'll find is you'll, you'll get back a lot more than what you put in. And plus, there's no excuses to people that, that sit there like, man, I have no opportunities today. It's like, bullshit. Like the, the world is the world is endless opportunities. If you've got a little bit of creativity, a little bit of motivation, and you can go out there and really, you know, really make something of yourself. Um, and so I, I'd say, don't be discouraged. Go go find whatever you're passionate about and just and just run with it and see where it takes you. Because there's no downside here, right? Like with the internet, you, you almost don't even need a college degree anymore to to become an expert in whatever you know specific thing you're interested in. So um, I, I'd, I'd sign off with that. Check out Upstream Data for sure, though. Really cool company. Great founder. Great team. Um, we've got like 
I think we've got like 125 Bitcoin mines delivered to the oil field as of to date. And so, um, you know, doing a lot of cool things over there, helping a lot of oil and gas producers learn about this stuff and take it on. Fantastic. Well, I'll put all the links in the show notes. And Adam, it's been a very enjoyable chat. Awesome. Thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks so much, Stefan. You're, you're awesome. I love your show. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep keep up the good fight. I think I'm going to see you at uh, BBB. So I'm, I'm sure I'll see you here in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, I will. See you there. Awesome. Cheers, man. So get the show notes at stefanlevera.com slash 299 and make sure you subscribe to the show by going to stefanlevera.com and clicking subscribe. I've got a big episode coming up next with Adam Beck of Blockstream. Keep an eye out for that one in the next few days. Thanks and I'll see you in the Citadels. (laughs) 